Autism affects around 700,000 people here in the UK. But my next guest was already a mother of four when she was diagnosed with the condition at the age of 45. Really interesting, actually. Um, we say you were 45 and diagnosed with autism, but you were actually in hospital for a completely different reason. And that's when it was discovered. How did that come about? So I found out um, in the March of 2015 that I have a connective tissue disorder called Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome, which kind of makes you quite flexible and it means your joints can dislocate and it gives you digestive issues. It's pretty horrible. And I was in hospital having some tests for a related condition to that. And it was really hot and it was really bright and there were no it, it was just awful. Um, and the tests were quite hardcore and I had a bit of a meltdown. And in the past, I've always thought it was me being princessy when I behaved like that. But the nurse just instantly recognized it as a classic autistic meltdown. And she was just like, oh God, we see loads of people with autism here. I'm so sorry, we should have kind of made it easier for you. And I thought, oh, it's like when you go into hospital and they kind of got the wrong person. <laughs> so, um, but then I thought about it and I kind of thought, I realized that I didn't know very much about autism. And I think I kind of had quite a stereotypical view. So I started researching it. And then the more I looked into women and autism, the more it was just like a light bulb moment. It was just so me. Well, I was about to say at that moment, did everything start to make sense? It did. When I was online, it did, yeah. When, when she just said it, I just thought, oh, she's completely wrong. You know, I'm a journalist, I communicate for a living. How could I possibly be autistic? But in kind of reading the traits in girls online, it was just like tick, tick, tick. And yeah, it was absolutely one of those moments. What, what were those traits then? Were there pinpoint moments that you thought, yes, that, that's me? Oh, it was things, I, I can't remember exactly, but it was things like sensory issues, kind of needing to wear very comfortable clothing all the time, needing things to be the same, so needing to have a real kind of sense of routine, but also not coping well at all with any kind of change of plans or any kind of change in environment, was things like kind of not being um, as social as other people, not kind of getting all of those cues, not understanding why people behave the way they behave, all sorts of things like that, really. Yeah, yeah. And then I guess looking back then through the years and those formative years and those difficult teenage years, um, did you have trouble then um, sort of communicating with people, relationships, friendships? Did you have issues back in those days, which obviously you couldn't have attached to, to autism, but you you would have had problems. Yeah, I think I think it's interesting whether there were problems or, or not, because when I was very small, I just wasn't that interested in other people. So when all the kids were racing around the playground or kind of wanting to go to parties or play together, I wanted to sit in the corner and read a book, and I felt quite happy with that. But I think the more you realise it's unusual, the more you realise you don't fit in, that's when it becomes a problem, because it's a problem to other people if you're not like everyone else, particularly in your teens. So I was completely addicted to Jilly Cooper novels, and I kind of thought that I thought everybody should behave how people in Jilly Cooper novels <laughs> behaved, because it's not always ideal. And not, not <laughs> ideal for a 15 year old girl growing up in London, no. Um, but, but I think that's kind of quite often what happens to autistic girls. They find they either find a character in a book or a girl at school or somebody to try and copy, to try and be like. And I just I just remember desperately wanting to be like the girls in Jilly Cooper's books. Really? And it's funny that that, that, st that sticks out for you, those, those little moments in those years. But um, I, I find it interesting then that having to explain to your family that I've just been diagnosed with autism at 45, your husband, your children, I mean, how did they react when you went home and said this, this has just happened? At that point, I think he was a bit diagnosed out because I'd just been diagnosed with my connective tissue disorder and a couple of other things, as had, my, our, as had our youngest son. So I think he was just feeling a bit overwhelmed by all of that. But um, the more I explained it, the more he was kind of supportive. And then I went to get the diagnosis and I came home and said, this is it. But he was prepared by that point. Yeah. But the children were, you know, the boys were hilarious. The first one said, can we go and count cards in Vegas? And the second one said, what's for supper? So, OK, life continues, <laughs> yeah, obviously, teenage boys. As, as it does, exactly. How much of an issue do you think undiagnosed autism is in, this, in, in the UK? Do you think there are a lot of people out there just like you in their 30s, 40s, 50s that just have been misdiagnosed or just undiagnosed entirely? Yeah, I think, I think that there are. I think it's particularly prevalent in women. And I think when I look back on my school days, we didn't ever hear the word autism no. or anything. We just no, didn't. No, I, I don't remember it at all. So, and I think that 
And I, and I think that if we did think of something like that, it came into public consciousness around the time of Rain Man, and mm. that's very different to how someone like me is. So I think there are a lot of undiagnosed people, particularly particularly women. Because yeah, you think girls can almost mask it without realising? I think we do. I think we try. I remember very clearly at five years old thinking, OK, I don't feel like these other people feel, but I'm going to have to do my very best to pretend that I do. So I would really consciously copy things. And, and if kind of Barbie dolls were in, then mm. I would kind of ask for a Barbie doll, even though I really didn't want one. Yes. Couldn't see the point of it. So, so yeah, I think I think girls and women do that. I also think that we're um, misdiagnosed a lot with mental health conditions, um, and I think that we're not. I think I think it's harder for women to be listened to and understood in many respects. In many respects, yeah, of course. Well, look, Laura, um, all to girl out. It is it is out now. It's the most fascinating read. It really is. It's it's and it's lovely to meet you in person. Having read the book, so it's lovely to see you. Thank you very much, Laura. Thank you.